Hi, and welcome to Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. Today, I'm continuing on in my series of lectures on plant and animal form and function. Now, if you hear a little bit of rain or thunder in the background, there's a rainstorm that's been on top of me for about the last hour, and uh, it keeps going away and coming back and going away and coming back, so I just decided to record anyways. But today I want to talk about the importance of plants. You know, why do we care about plants? Why are they important? But I do think it's important for us to build connections to plants. Because if we don't really relate to plants or we don't really care about plants, it's hard to learn about them. So I'm hoping that after this lecture, you'll have a little bit more appreciation for plants, maybe a little bit more of a connection to them, and that way they'll seem a bit more exciting to learn about. The first thing I'm going to talk about is how plants have been crucially important for the evolution and diversity of life on this planet. I mean, they've had plants have had an amazing impact on life on this planet. And today, plants remain incredibly important. They provide us different types of ecological services. They're important for our civilization for lots of reasons. We get medicine from them and plants are good for our well-being. I mean, how many of you have a flower garden or like to grow your own vegetables? I'm not very good at growing vegetables, but I definitely, I plant trees and I have a flower garden. I like taking long walks in the woods and I get a lot of satisfaction over growing stuff. So let's begin, you know, why plants are important. And I think uh, we're gonna do a little bit of evolutionary history here. I know plant and animal form and function, but hey, Evolution matters, right? I mean, Dobzhansky said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I take that to heart because that's the central paradigm of our, of our field. So plants have had an enormous impact on the evolution of life on this planet and even geology as well. So obviously, you know, one thing that plants do is they do photosynthesis. You know, they're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, water out of the ground or out of the water, and they make sugars out of the carbon dioxide. They fix the carbon into usable forms, but they release oxygen. And photosynthesis has been releasing oxygen into the atmosphere for billions of years. And with the advent of the first plants, whether it's a, a billion years ago or seven to 100 million years ago, plants have been releasing oxygen into the atmosphere. And when they moved on to land, they began to really add even larger amounts of oxygen to the atmosphere. And this graph shows it. And I, interestingly, you can see the bump up in oxygen levels by percent volume in, in uh, the Earth's atmosphere in about 600 million years ago. The Cambrian explosion, which is this rapid diversification of animal life, occurred about 542 million years ago. So I find that very interesting that we see this rapid diversification of animals with this higher levels of oxygen. Then let's jump ahead. Let's go to 300 million years ago, 350, 300. We start to see, well, actually go back to 400 million years ago and oxygen levels begin to ramp up again. That is the colonization of land. That's the greening of the earth. So we don't just have photosynthesis taking place in the oceans now. It's taking place on land. And there's a lot of room on land for these plants to grow. So we get our first forest. Oxygen levels peaked, oh, about 300 million years ago at almost 35% of our atmosphere. Now that's some pretty big consequences for life on the earth. But importantly, you know, oxygen, we need it, right? Oxygen energizes life. It makes life very efficient at getting energy out of organic molecules. And as a result, life, I mean, animals evolve, right? Animals are large, complex organisms, the very active lifestyle. And you need lots of energy to do that. And oxygen, like I said, it energized life. It made basically multicellular life possible along with animals. <clears throat> now, in addition to just adding oxygen to our world and energizing life, plants also created what is called ecological complexity. They're just adding structure to the environment. And starting 
maybe a billion years ago, there might have been the first algae precursors to plants. And so that would have been an ancestor. And evolving multicellularity, you can start to see rather than having a flat bottom on the, on the ocean, you have these algae growing up and creating complexity. There's more area, there's more things going on. And that ecological complexity does several things. It creates more habitats for things to live. It also, in addition to adding oxygen, they're providing nutrients. Because like, I'll say this several times, every carbon atom in your body was fixed by a plant. Every bit of energy, chemical energy inside of your body was also fixed by a plant. So as plants evolved, this is of course the precursors to plants, or maybe a plant, maybe an algae, I don't really know. They're kind of a little bit before plants probably, but they're adding nutrients and energy to ecosystems. They're adding structural complexity. So you can see plants are doing a lot for us, right? And in fact, I mentioned that about 542 million years ago, we entered a time period called the Cambrian. In fact, it was the end of the Proterozoic Eon and it began the Phanerozoic Eon, which we're in now, which means visible life. And this rapid radiation of animals some 540 million years ago, part of the reason why we may have had it is more oxygen, more nutrients and energy available to the environment and more habitat complexity. So, you know, very, very important. But there are effects of plants and their ancestors, multicellular precursors to plants, I guess, is not just limited to the marine ecosystems. As I said in an earlier lecture video, the earth was barren for like 4.2 billion years. I mean, the earth is 4.6 billion years. It is only in that last 0.4 billion years, which is about 400 million years, that we've had plants on the surface of the earth. And it looked like this, you know, this is, I love this picture of Canyonlands National Park up in Utah. Yeah, if you look closely, you can see the Green River flowing through it. So there's plants in the picture, but you get the idea. Before plants about 420 million years ago, it was barren. There, there were no plants. There were no forests. There were no animals on land. Now, that changed. It changed during the Silurian, up to 420 million years ago. Now, 475 million years ago, that's the Ordovician, if I remember, we're still in the Paleozoic era, um, plants began to live on land, and it took them a long time. It took them a very long time to evolve into trees. But by 400 million years ago, in the Devonian, if I got my time periods right, still in the Paleozoic era, we're getting the first forest. That's huge. I've already pointed out that, you know, you've got more photosynthesis occurring on land. As a result, you're getting higher amounts of oxygen in the atmosphere. But also, as plants evolved into trees, they evolved roots. Roots go into the soil or into the ground. And they hold soil. They prevent runoff. They lock in nutrients. So as the forest grew, it was a positive feedback. It allowed these forests to spread throughout the world as they built up the soils. And now you've got more oxygen in the atmosphere. You're providing nutrients and energy to ecosystems. And because you have a forest, you've got lots of places for animals to live. You're creating all types of little habitats and niches that uh, you, you can now have more diversification of life. Now this high oxygen levels, I keep talking about this, right? Because it's pretty interesting. I mean, today we have about 21% oxygen in the atmosphere, but at 300 million years ago, it was like 35%. And uh, this was huge. This was because of the greening of the earth and it had this amazing effect on the arthropods. And when I talk about animal form and function, I'll go into the circulatory system of animals, specifically arthropods, and you'll start to make the connection of why they grew so large. But could you imagine a six foot centipede? That, I mean, that's terrifying, right? I, I mean, I'd, I'd probably run and hide. Um, the other thing that'd be really cool is dragonflies. You know, dragonflies are 
when they talk about ancient organisms, they're like over 300 million years old. And the biggest ones today are about yay big. But could you imagine one the size of a gall? Of a small gall anyways. That'd be amazing. I mean, a dragonfly like this big flying around. And the reason why these arthropods could get so large is because of all the extra oxygen in the atmosphere. Photosynthesis. What does it take out of the atmosphere? Carbon dioxide. And if you're a wet, swampy world, uh, you don't always decay your plant matter very well, your organic matter. So what happened is over the Devonian and Carboniferous for millions and millions of years, tens of millions of years, plants actually took so much carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and it got sequestered. It got lithified. Litho means rock. It got turned into coal deposits. And you can see in this graph, CO2 levels plummeted. CO2 levels went from about 2,000 parts per million down to 150, maybe even 100 parts per million. And this cooled the earth and it dried out and it caused a collapse of these swampy rainforests and it sent the planet to an ice age. And in fact, we got so close to a runaway ice age, we may have almost entered a period of complete global glaciation like we saw hundreds of millions of years ago in the cryogenian that ended about 630 million years ago where ice sheets covered the earth all the way down to the equator we didn't quite get there i'm very glad but that triggered a massive ice age you can clearly see the plants are having this enormous effect on the diversification of animals and not just creating more habitats and allowing for more animals to evolve but making it possible with the oxygen and affecting the size of what these animals grow based on the amount of oxygen as well. And now they've changed the climate. And you change climate, well, life adapts. So plants, of course, evolved what is called the seed plants by about 300 million years ago. So as we enter the Permian period, we start getting seed plants. We also get the first animals called an amniote. I know I'm talking about animals again, but you, me, birds, and reptiles are all amniotes. Internal reproduction has an egg, things like that. Uh, and in fact, if you look at this picture, you can see this lizard-like thing with these big fins. That's Dimetrodon. That's an ancestor to mammals. Not, It's not a lizard. That's not a reptile. Kind of cool. I know. I know animals. But I'm going to talk about them again. Let's jump ahead. We're going from 300 million years ago, which is still millions of years before dinosaurs showed up, like 70 million years. We're going to go to the early Cretaceous. So now we're in the Mesozoic era, better known as the age of the dinosaurs. Sometime around 135 million years ago, flowering plants evolved. And these first flowering plants, they attracted pollinators, insect pollinators. And one of these themes that I want to hit hard here is diversity gives rise to diversity. So as flowers evolve to attract insects, guess what? You start getting some type of coevolution. You get unique flowers attracting unique insects. So flowers diversified, insects diversified. And you know, these are different types of pollinators, bees and butterflies, wasps, and also um Flies. Guy brain farted there. Now, if you've got pollinators coming to your flowers, guess what? You're going to have predators waiting there to ambush them. And uh, I took this series of photos in North Florida. It's pretty cool. That's a bumblebee. And that plant is called a pickerel weed. And I was taking photos. I was about, you know, waist deep of water, wandering around the edge of the river. And uh, I saw the, the bee. I looked away at a bird. And then I turned around and that bee was nailed by that green link spider. So there's a predator. There's another green link spider. You know, you don't have to go to crazy places to see these things. This was taken in my mom's flower garden. And that's a green link spider eating a candy stripe leafhopper. So the idea is if you've got pollinators, you've got different types of predators to go after those pollinators. Here's another one, crab spiders. Go look on your flowers. You'll probably find these. 
ambush predators. Now, what's interesting is for years, we always thought that they were yellow to be camouflaged, or they would kind of match the flower to be camouflaged. Um, and we just assumed that was right. But it just goes to show in science, you have to test your hypotheses. Turns out that if you're an insect, you can see in the ultraviolet. These spiders actually make the flower brighter to help bring in the pollinator, not camouflaged at all. Here's more predators. Yeah, I know that guy's just hanging out, you know, eating an insect. That's a robber fly. There's a couple of different assassin bugs. Yeah, so more predators, lots of predators. And then not only do you have predators, you also get mimicry. So here's an example. You don't mess with bees. Bees will sting you. So if you look like a bee, leave it alone. So some animals have evolved to look like bees. On the top left, that is a fly. I know, it's a flower fly. And it has evolved to look like a bumblebee. And on the bottom left, that's a beetle. I promise you, it's a beetle also mimicking to look like a bumblebee. So you're starting to see. Diversity gives rise to diversity. And then ah, nature is brutal. This is a female wasp. It's attacking a caterpillar. It's going to lay her egg in the caterpillar. The egg will hatch. Eat the caterpillar from the inside out, leaving all the vital organs intact. And then finally, when the wasp is ready, it will morph into the adult and bust out of the caterpillar, killing it. Nature is brutal. I think I made a pretty good case of why plants are important evolutionarily. Let's talk about ecologically. And we're going to go through how they stabilize soils, affect local and global climates, adding oxygen to the atmosphere, and creating habitats. We all know photosynthesis is important. I've already talked about this. It adds oxygen to the atmosphere. It maintains these high levels of oxygen that we need today. Plants also take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it in carbohydrates. And we say it fixes carbon dioxide. Now, importantly, by doing that, it's making those nutrients available to you. So basically all of us animals, we get our carbon and all of our other nutrients and energy either directly from plants or by eating animals that eat plants. So as you can see, um, incredibly important. Also, just like in evolution, plant roots stabilize the soil. They prevent runoff. They allow water to soak in. That allows the water to soak in and be absorbed by plants. And then the plants will release the water through their leaves. That's called evapotranspiration. That is the amount of water leaving the plant and it has to get it from its roots. And um, how fast a plant grows depends on its rate of evapotranspiration. And when you go down to a rainforest like the Amazon, the rate of evapotranspiration is incredibly high. And in fact, not only uh, is plant growth related to evapotranspiration, so is diversity. And in the rainforest, like 90% of the water in the rainforest is continually recycled. So it, it goes up through the leaves, gets in the atmosphere, condenses, falls down as rain, hits the soil, goes back into the roots, and is recycled over and over and over again. That 10% is what flows out through the Amazon River, and 10% flows in or gets blown in off the Atlantic into the basin. So when you begin to clear cut these ecosystems, bad things happen. You start losing a loss of habitat. Your soil begins to erode and you begin to lose all of those nutrients you've accumulated. And then not only that, it affects local climates. Okay, if water is evaporating, it keeps it cool. If you don't have that, it warms up. As it warms up, it actually lowers humidity and prevents rain and causes the soils to lose more water. And in fact, the Amazon, with the rampant amount of clear cutting, is actually causing it to get warmer and drier. And who's ever heard of a rainforest like that having massive droughts? So we're very concerned that if you cut enough of the rainforest down and patch it all up, then it could actually collapse. Our civilization depends on plants. I mean, completely. Food. I mean, that's an obvious one, right? 
whether you're growing rice or corn or wheat or barley or potatoes, you know, all of our foods that we eat are ultimately plants. We get most of our calories from plants. I mean, we get them from cows too, but I mean, you are what you eat, right? Cows eat grasses. Shouldn't really feed them corn. Humans not only use plants for food, we also use them for building material. I live in a wooden house. I grew up in a log cabin in North Florida. People have been using wood for a really long time to build their homes and other structures, including sailing ships, like the Black Pearl. You know, the Black Pearl was what's was once called the Wicked Winch. But the East India Tea Company and this guy named Cutler Beckett basically captured Captain Jack Sparrow and sank the Wicked Winch because he wouldn't transport slaves. Captain Jack Sparrow broke free of his captors, right? And he sailed to the Wicked Winch as it was sinking. And he made a call to Davy Jones, you know, who on the Flying Dutchman, and says, um, hey, can you bring back my ship and make it the fastest on the seven seas. Yeah, so he made a deal basically with the devil here. So Davy Jones brought back the Wicked Winch. And Captain Jack Sparrow repainted it and called it the Black Pearl. Pretty cool. And of course, these were wooden sailing ships from Pirates of the Caribbean. One of my favorite movies of all time. Okay, plants. I mean, food, building materials, medicines. About half of all of our medicines are derived from plants. You know, plants are chemical factories, right? They're making all kinds of chemicals. So aspirin, aspirin comes from the bark of a willow tree. The ancient Greeks actually knew that if you chewed on some willow bark, it would make your pain go away. Well, in modern times, we've, we've discovered what the active ingredient is. Here's another one. The yew tree makes this chemical called taxol. And we think it's a defense against fungal infections because, you know, plants have to defend themselves against fungus, against herbivory, you name it. So they're making all kinds of chemicals to prevent that. Now, this Taxol is an anti-cancer drug, which is pretty cool. And you like all your herbs and spices, you know, like rosemary, thyme, garlic, yum. Mm. How about here in New Mexico, right? We got the green chilies. With all the capsaicins. So all of these chemicals that we use as our herbs and spices are very yummy. And a lot of them are there to prevent herbivory of insects. So you know what's bad for an insect isn't so bad for us. And in fact, it's actually in our interest. It's good for us to eat a lot of different types of herbs and spices. And then plants. They have a cell wall made up of cellulose that forms fiber. We can't digest it. So it passes through. It keeps things moving through. But it also creates habitats for all of our different gut, gut microbes. And we know that a plant-based diet high in fiber is really, really good to improving our gut health. It's kind of cool. And uh, there's some cotton. And of course, cotton, we've used it for hundreds of years in our clothing. I'm wearing a cotton shirt right now. My hat is made out of cotton. And then lastly, nature makes us happy. Greenery makes us happy. And, you know, are you feeling stressed, anxious, stressed out? A walk in a place that's green can make you feel better. And in fact, I didn't just make that up. There's actually some studies showing how not just exercise alone, but also being out in nature, being around trees can make you happier. And of course, there's my daughter and she's got her walking stick. So plant sticks also are good as a walking aid in the woods. Well, I hope by now you have a little bit more of an appreciation for plants because they are important in many, many different ways. Okay, until next time, I think we're gonna start some serious form and function on the next series of videos. This has been Tom Kennedy Science.